Well, I heard lots of war stories for the first war. And in those days, all the little boys played war games and played with lead soldiers. So when I was a little kid, uh, our maids always were, had soldiers drop me into the kitchen and have a cup of tea and a peanut butter sandwich and tell me lurid tales about their exciting life. When I was 15, actually I, a couple of my older friends uh, had already joined, but when I went down to join, they told me to come back on my 15th birthday, which I did. Well, of course, when I was in high school, we were watching the ascent of Mussolini and Hitler, and uh, for skits at our school play, we were always mimicking Hitler, mimicking Mussolini, and make, rather making fun of them. We took the Nazis and fascists as a joke. We thought they were so serious with their goose-stepping soldiers and uh, very pompous, self-important people. So we, we thought they were really quite a laugh. But we didn't realize that the Germans were very, very good soldiers and, and getting ready for a war. Uh, actually, the war broke out in the last week of August 1939, I believe. And uh, I was on a cruise down the Rideau River, but it was a very hot night and the lockmaster allowed me and Harry Swam I was with whom I was sailing to sleep in the blockhouse at about 11 o'clock. He came and knocked on the door and said, you fellas wearing them khaki clothes, I figured there's something to do with the army. He said, you might like to know that on the news just said that Britain has declared war on Germany. So that was the first we heard of the outbreak of war. In my class at RMC, uh, there were four or five went to the Navy, of whom two were killed. Uh, about eight went to the Air Force, uh, most of whom were killed. Uh, one went into the Gurkhas and was killed in Burma. A Spike Purdy in the Ontario Tank Regiment landed at Dieppe. I was with the 14th Coburg Battery, and we, we supported the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, called the Rileys. And um, they were all great guys and very, very effective soldiers. The two of us were, were wounded and two killed in the first month of combat, I should say. And the other two got promoted to replace majors who'd killed or promoted. So we, we took an awful beating. But the, I was with, on that particular battle, I was attached to the Fusilier Montréal and uh, they were waking up about three in the morning and said, we, we have to march, we have to be over across the Ord by two o'clock tomorrow after, this, this, this afternoon. So they walked about, they marched about half the night, got no breakfast, got no lunch, and went and attacked at two o'clock in the afternoon. That attack, when we finished, got through the 207th Division, they surrendered quite readily. Then we came up against the 12th SS with uh, their Panzers, and uh, their tanks were very good, much better than our Shermans. By about dusk, one of, they said, we've got to go back to lager and get more fuel, get more ammunition and eat. We said, well, who, who's going to be with us overnight? They said, nobody, but that's your problem. <laughs> so in the next morning, we had no anti-tank guns and no armor. And uh, with firing an awful lot of artillery ammunition, we were able to hold on to, that was a place called Trotval Farm. There were two farms just short of our air, uh, Beauvoir Farm and Trotval Farm. So we were able to hold on through, I think, four attacks, including the last one. Well, we held on through three. The fourth one, uh, we, were, we were overrun. The, the, uh, these, in their camouflage smocks, these uh, Panzer Grenadiers from the, uh, pa from the 12th SS running along between the tanks, and our shells were bursting around them, and they just kept running along between the tanks, which sheltered them. First thing we knew at the FMI, we were surrounding. There were 
uh, in my, my company by that time, uh, there were only 17 left of whom 12 were, <coughs> 12 were wounded. So uh, uh, at that point, when I saw the go to surrender, we jumped in our carrier and made a run for it. We thought, first of all, we're gonna try to crawl out through the grain when the, when the carrier wouldn't saw it. But uh, eventually my driver, uh, Chris May, killed him shortly later. I got the thing going and we made a run for it. But these German tanks kept spraying us. My carrier had about half the paint chipped off with the, I got us how, how many rounds of ammo they fired at us. We kept scrunching down. We had a couple of these tins of hardtack lashed on top of the carrier, over top of the engine compartment. And the bullets from these machine guns tearing tore those cans all to shreds, and uh, white dust was scattering all over us. I thought, oh God, this, this uh, <laughs> must be some sort of chemical weapon. Uh, so uh, we, we were quite uh, panicky about that, but then we, somebody tasted a bit of it and accidentally found that it's, it's just our old damn hardtack. And uh, that, we were very lucky we got, we got out of there. We were very green troops, so we were, and as luck would have it, we were put, came into action against uh, a German division called the 12th SS Panzerdiv, called himself the Hitler Youth Division. They had very superior to us. And in point of fact, of training and experience, they were superior, because while we'd been sitting in England for three and a half years on what's really garrison duty along the south coast. Uh, some of them had been on the East Front fighting Russians and others had been in North Africa. On the 25th of July, uh, the second division attacked from Eif down toward the Verrier Ridge, a very tough battle. Uh, and the Rileys captured their objective, but they were the only unit in the division that did. And uh, I was wounded, and uh, the other other captain from the, my battery was killed. And the uh, Rileys lost about three over 300 men. I think Second Div lost 1,100 and some killed and wounded in that that battle. I was with with my regular you know, the Hamilton Light Infantry, and we had a minefield. My driver was killed instantly, and my two signalers in the back and, and myself were blown out. But I got blasted across the side of the legs with the same, with the, at the same time as my driver was killed. And I got a ricochet off the ground that whacked me just below the my skull in the back of my neck embedded it somewhere in the low, lower part of my head. And my two signalers carried me on, a, brought a stretcher and carried me out to the road of the stretcher. But the Germans were mortaring it to the, so that every time they hear a, a mortar bomb come whistling down, they'd drop the stretcher. Well, they're, only, they're, they're running with Ben over, so I'd only drop it about a foot. But I was getting pretty shook up. But unfortunately, as we went back down the paved road, we had to pass under, under the barrels of, of these Shermans that were lined up with their guns cocked out about five, 45 degrees. And at least twice as we were going back, they, they fired right up of it. So I, could, I was completely deaf. They put me on a hospital ship, and then uh, we came up past Bermuda to into Halifax, and my sister was in the Air Force, so uh, down to, she wasn't down on the wharf when the ship docked, and she was looking up at me and yelling something I couldn't see, and then she went like that, and she said, you've got a medal. And I said, which one? She said, military cross. So uh, the hospital train took us up to Kingston. When we got into Kingston Station, my wife to me, uh, Sally Carruthers, and my family were all, except one of my sisters in the Air Force, we're waiting on the platform, and uh, 
a dark-haired woman came running on the platform, grabbed me, and it was Sally Carruthers. And I, but she'd been a blonde when I went away, and she, her hair was <laughs> light brown when I got back. But it was the right was the right girl, all right. She waited four years for me. I, she was 18 when we got engaged in November 1940, just before I went overseas, and. Uh, held out for all those, through all those exciting for, war, war years, said, um, I guess I could never really have been pro properly grateful to her. We were married for 68 years and had three wonderful children, and uh, she died in 1912, or sorry, 2012. What you're doing is getting a later view now that those of us who are alive are all in our 90s, and uh, uh, very important that it be preserved. I don't know whether anyone will ever listen to them or watch them 